Hello and welcome back to Adagio Live for this fourth episode on the Bach Cello Suites. Today, the Sarabande from the first suite. In about 15 to 20 minutes, my guest will be Sonia Zimenauer, who is an artistic agent and who is as passionate as goes about music in general and she will tell us what the Bach Suites are for her. Um, about our topic, I will first go through the Sarabande with a few indications about pearls, about different things, and I would like to use the Sarabande to talk about a question that uh, has been sent to me on Instagram by Zachary and Matteo Celli about ornamentation. Ornamentation, yes or no? If yes, when and how? So, and since this Sarabande is one of the movements where I sometimes allow myself some ornamentations, I will um, talk about this. Now, you might, if you saw the title of this episode, you might have wondered if I had smoked something or in which kind of mood I was, because I called it uh, Sarabande from the first suite, the erotic of one and two. Now, with this title, um, my attempt is to uh, rumble against a widespread and recurrent misunderstanding about the feel, about the pulse of the Sarabande uh, that I have met again and again with my students but also that I had, that took me years to sort of uh, understand, basically, and feel. So, uh, very, very often, when I ask uh, a student who brings for the first time a Sarabande uh, to me, I ask him, okay, how, how is the pulse of the Sarabande? What's important in the Sarabande? Uh, because, as you might have noticed by now, uh, pulse and how the music swings is for me the absolute priority and is the condition before starting to find an interpretation of these dances. And very often the answer is, well, in the Sarabande, it's the second beat. The second beat is important, which is not wrong, but which is too short. And there is a very, very important element missing in this answer. The Sarabande was indeed a, a dance that came from Spain originally. And if you read it, as for, first, one of the first things that, that is said that it is um, a, a dance with a very erotic component from, uh, you know, even before the Baroque, from, from Spain. Now, where I see the erotic is in the extraordinary attraction between the first and the second beat. So, for years, myself, as a student, I was just trying to give a heavy second beat. Until I realized it's not just about giving a heavy second beat, it's about feeling how when I play the downbeat, which is a downbeat, and which has to have the substance of a downbeat, which has to have some, some contact with the bow and some weight, I play this and then there is an energy that takes me to the second beat. So, let me try to uh, demonstrate. <laughs> In other words, what is really the, the, the core of the Saraband feeling is the flow when you start from the downbeat to the second beat. And we will see that in later Sarabands, in the other suites, um, Bach is going to experiment with different kinds of, of Saraband and he's going to play around with that basic uh, pulse. Many, basically in six different ways, 
but uh, thank uh, thanks for the to the for the subject that I wanted to bring today about the basic step, the basic groove of the sarabande. This sarabande of the first suite has is is like a. a um, Cadecol, we would say in French, like really a, a perfect example of this. Um, I um, want to give just a, 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 a metaphor that uh, is for me uh, inspiring. I think we talked last time, you remember, about gravity, you know, about where, how we play the downbeat. And I do think in general that music, and particularly this world of the suites by Bach, has something to do with the sort of uh, a solar system where there would be different gravitational forces that all play a role. And here is, is this example, because what gives the energy to the Sarabande is that, the, that we will have this drive bringing us to the second beat, which is not originally something natural in this music, in a 3-4 in a bar. Um, about the first half, I will now play the first half and I will tell you a few things uh, about it, a few, a few thoughts. <laughs> Structures, uh, structure of these eight bars, as very often as all major composers do, is short, short, long. Two bars, two bars, four bars. And I think I want to speak mainly now to the cellists among you uh, to say that remember that that's where the new chords are coming that you give an impulse to the music. So, very often at the beginning of the Sarabande, uh, what happens is that the end of the second bar sounds very much like a, like a not beat to the third bar, which I think it shouldn't. This third beat of the second bar is just still in the, in the uh, waving of, of, the, of the first and second beat. Here we are swinging and then... A, G is just finishing these two bars. And then we do a modulation. Again, modulation back to G major. And now we have our four bar structure starting. Just two words, uh, don't worry, I don't, I don't want to get too technical and things, but two words about the hemiola and what it gives us performers. Basically, Bach uses it a lot at the end of a section, and it's a way for him, you know, imagine if there was a dancer um, dancing on our playing, uh, suddenly he realizes that the beat is not anymore as usual, one, two, three, but one, two, three, one, two, three, and there is a different kind of bit, and that shows us, aha, okay, end of a phrase. And this is something that Bach will use over and over again, but a lot in our fugue, in the prelude of the fifth suite. Um, yes, I think there are, by the way, three hemioles in this, in this Sarabande. Uh, and I won't show all of them, but just to say that they are, you can choose as a performer to bring them out more or less depending on your feeling. Now, I think now is the moment where uh, I can talk about ornamentation. 
And so, first of all, I want to say I'm going to give my, um, my way to go at ornamentation in the bar suite. Some people are uh, in principle against it, which is absolutely fine. Uh, I think Anna Belsma, who is my mentor for the bar suite, uh, was actually not for it in general, with one exception of the end of the, sec of the second prelude. Um, but I use it sometimes in the repeats, obviously, when uh, we want to use the repeat to explore the same music in a different way. And here I will show you how I use ornamentation. And basically, I think ornamentation is there to illustrate in notes uh, the swing of the music. So, in, see, if we talk about the first bar. <laughs> After this, this very profound second beat, we are hanging there. We are in the, in the aftermath of this action that happened. And that's a good moment when we are hanging, when we are basically not down, but up there in our, in our swing. That's a good moment where you can put little notes that evoke that feeling of freedom and of swing. So, when that's just to help you to maybe to how to decide where to put ornamentation. And ornamentation, I think, should be there. It should bring lightness when the music requires it. So, on bar three, I sometimes, for this... Uh, that's such an expressive um, interval. And sometimes, the second time around, I like to... Uh, which brings, sort of, like I, if I would hang for longer on the upper D, and, and then abandon and let go. Uh, Sometimes here, instead of I don't and here we are starting our four bar phrase and to show a little bit the the excitement that is building. <laughs> time in the last two bars I don't do it because I, I did a lot in the, in the two bars before and, and one shouldn't push it too far. So, um, some little simple rules when you do ornament. Do not uh, go outside of the frame that the composer gives you. So, for example, when I did... Uh, <laughs> So Bach goes from I can do pretty much what I want within these notes. Uh, same thing here. Uh, or when I do a, I'm still within the note, the highest note that Bach gave and the lowest note that he gives in this passage, I respect. Otherwise you really change the melody. If you do a, then it starts to be problematic because you, yes, you go out of the frame that, that he gives you. That's the one thing. The other thing I want to give you, and it's a little anecdote of something that happened to me uh, a few years ago. I was to play a Vivaldi sonata uh, in a concert that was shared with uh, my friend and amazing violinist uh, Amandine Bayer. And uh, she was sitting in the hall for the dress rehearsal and in the fast movement of this Vivaldi sonata, I wanted in the repeat to do acrobatic things, you know, to add many notes and to, to just illustrate this energy that is in this music by Vivaldi. And one of these runs was really not working well, so I was struggling. And she gave me, because she has much more knowledge about historic uh, practice than me, and she told me, you know, Jean-Guerre, 
at that time, the Baroque, they would never do an ornament that is against the instrument. They really did what falls under the fingers. So when you choose your ornament, do it. This is the kind of thing that you should do on the instrument because it should be related to, you know, it should go easy. It should, it should be sort of a... And it shouldn't be something where suddenly you have to do crazy fingerings in order to achieve. So I thought it was very valuable information for me. And since then, uh, I tried to respect it. Uh, in the second half of this Saraband, I want to talk about the last four bars. Because for many of us cellists, they are a bit like a mystery because it's like if Bach condensed times because there is a lot happening harmonically uh, in, in a way in too little time. So I will play the second half now. in E minor. And now to go back, we have first this very condensed, uh, uh, very economical uh, modulation to C major, which is uh, questioning, I find, at this point. And then we will go to A minor, so far so good. But in between the two, Bach inserts this F sharp which is almost shocking, because once we did... We are there, we were, we are in C major, uh, and then we could go to A minor. But no, he does this extraordinary... Uh, which does give something almost a bit painful in our rise to this beautiful um, uh, chant du sing up there. And then we are A minor, and again, just through one note in the scale, which is unexpected and comes in a way at the wrong moment, he brings us back to G major. So, within two bars of this very seemingly simple and short piece, we experience suddenly uh, something very, in a way, disturbing, in a beautiful way, disturbing, and that took us out of our zone of comfort. And we will see again and again in the slow, in the Allemands and Sarabands, that Bach almost always finds a way to, to, to make us uncomfortable in, for the best reasons uh, uh, in, in, in these second halves of these slow dances. Um, yes, so that was it about... We will talk more one more, uh, another time about how... In, which are the other ways to vary the repeat. How do I revisit what I just played not just for the sake of something, of doing something different, but because when you play one part, like the A part or the B part, you make a statement. And then if you repeat that statement, you are going to, to be a different person because you just made a statement. And if you repeat this statement, you are not going to just repeat it for the sake of repeating it. You are going to, to revisit what Bach composed. And we will see that ornamentation is one way, but there are um, uh, many other ways to do it, with, with sound, with contact, with, uh, with timing. Uh, but for now, um, I think this is the moment where I would like to call Sonia Zimenauer to join us for the talk. Hello, Sonia. Can you hear me? Are you there? I can hear you and I'm yes. there. Hello, Sonia. Welcome and thank you for taking the time 
to to talk to us about thank you about for that. explaining to me this part the way i've never heard it explained thank you so much sonia uh, so for just a few words um uh, Uh, for um, our friends out there. So I have the incredible joy uh, to uh, work with you, Sonia, uh, since a few years, but it's much more than work. It's so wonderful um, uh, to, to, to be in touch with your extraordinary experience uh, as an artistic agent, but uh, as, a, as somebody who is so passionate about music. And In your um, uh, career, well, no, I was. We'll talk about this later. The the first thing is that when I asked you if you would accept to come and and talk to us about about the bar suite, you told me, well, for me the bar suite it started long, long ago. And could you tell us about that? Well, it started with my life because uh, um, my father was an amateur cellist and a passionate musician. And he would uh, play in the evening. He was a doctor. And after dinner, his way of recovering from the day was to go behind his cello. And my room as a child was beside the living room. So I, when, I, when I was in bed at night, I would hear my father take up his cello and always begin with the Bach first, sweet first movement. And then I was falling asleep. But this was, this was the way for me to go to bed and to sleep. And whenever I hear the first tone of this suite, it's, it's, it's a beaming me back to being a child. In some ways, it's a very subtle thing. So this has been my, this, this was for him like doing his scales. And that remained all my life in my head like this. That's, That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So does that mean that you, there is a good chance you will fall asleep when you go to a, to a Bach recital starting with the first prelude? <laughs> no. Maybe for the best of it. <laughs> exactly. Um, I, my whole childhood, I've been sleeping when I went to concerts and that's, these are my best memories. But um, I wanted to ask you, you, you the, the first part of your career as an um, artistic agent, you worked a lot with uh, string quartets, you still do, you still have all the great quartets we know today, Belchia, Artemis, Eben, you name them. And uh, they are all in, in uh, they all want to be working with you because of your experience. And you wrote this, this extraordinary uh, book about this particularly, about the life of a string quartet and the life of the musicians with it. And, and um, this, called, uh, this book is called in German, Mustas Sein. Um, and I really, really, really highly recommend it. Now, that's already chamber music, obviously, so very intimate about this. How do you see, when you see a solo recital, somebody playing by himself or by herself, uh, and, and in particular Bach, is it one step further? Is it even more uh, intimate? Or how, how do you see the, the, the difference? Or how do you see that? Well, the string quartet is like a complete independent instrument. It's closed. It needs nothing more than the string quartet. And to my feeling, it's the same with Bach, with a solo instrument. When, um, when I hear the solo cello or the, cello, the solo violin or solo piano, it's a world in itself. It's, it's just closed. It's like entering a cathedral and the cathedral is full of Bach. And uh, it's like a prayer. It's like it's something very, very big. And I can I can enter it, and it will take me someplace. And it's um, it's interesting because there I can also feel the musician best. I can feel the musician best for whom I work. I can understand best who he is, because Bach doesn't allow for hiding that's my feeling i can't play it so i'm very happy i can't play an instrument otherwise i would have to play bach and that would be awful <laughs> but for me as an agent mm -hmm. to be able to hear my artist in a bach piece is like a prisma like understanding where they come from 
And it doesn't matter whether they come from the more romantic side or the more um, baroque side. It just doesn't matter because it conveys something that tells me so much. That's so um, interesting that you mentioned that about the, the in a way, the how transparent we are when we play this music, because uh, in these first episodes, um, basically we have been we have been uh, looking for yeah for even for the way we breathe the way we swing and and actually we have no choice but to put to put this as we all are with all our differences in this music to make it really live and to make it breathe and to make it dance and uh, i guess probably do you think that could be one of the reasons that even though it has been played so many, many million times and, and people are still um, going to the concert to hear it and they are still interested to hear new versions and, and, and what, the, what young musicians are going to do with it? I think that it is an instrument, that it is a music that is not for competition. Um, you are so right. <laughs> it's a music that is only to be a talking one to one. It's not a show off. It's not a music that you, you need to be a virtuoso to play it, but it never shows that you're a virtuoso. So it's not a glamour music. It's not, um, it, it needs a big room for one person alone. And then it it goes into the in, into the full room, and I think that is something that no musician can hide. If they can't do that, then they have a problem mm -hmm. on the big stage. Wonderful! Thank you so much, Sonia. Do you, do Just have... one thing: it's yes, very yes. interesting mm -hmm. when you when you go to a concert of a soloist um, with a big orchestra. A lot of them will take this opportunity to play Bach for an encore. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a big mistake. Just no more. <laughs> well, okay, we'll try to, uh, to remember your warnings, Sonia, or yeah, yeah. But um, thank you for sharing with us your, your your passion Pleasure. for this music and uh, and uh, everybody i will see you on saturday for the next episode at seven o'clock and uh, we will talk about the menuets the galanterie of this first suite and that will be uh, yeah saturday seven o'clock and there will be of course one more guest who will tell us his or her passion for the bar suites see you there bye bye